Hello, everybody. Hello. I am Rachel Torres. Welcome to day two of the Rachel Torres Bitcoin Conference. Oh, that's, that's not what you wanted to do here. It's what I want to do, so let me, no, I'm just kidding. It's Amplify day two. What did you think of those demos? This is where you clap. Woo! I loved seeing them. It's great to see the hard work of our amazing product team uh, come to life. I'm super excited about our experimentation capabilities. We know the best companies in the world do tons of experimentation, and I'm so excited companies of all sizes are going to be able to do it faster. Speaking of fast, this conference is flying by. Um, we have two sessions left in this room, and we're going to run straight through back to back. And our next first up speakers are going to tell us a little bit more about what the best companies do for data-informed product. That's what it is, right? Am I on the target, sort of? Good. That's good enough for me. Um, one of our speakers is not as famous as the other one. <laughs> I think we all know that. That's fine. Sorry. Um, he is our enterprise marketing director. He's amazing. He's a recovered academic, a recovered investment banker, um, and now he's building our enterprise growth engine. I guess which one is which. Um, the next one is a legend in the product world. Uh, we're so lucky to have him as an evangelist here at Amplitude. Uh, I feel smarty, smarter every time I talk to him, and you should follow him on Twitter and LinkedIn and Substack if you don't already. So let's hear it for he and Fan and John Cutler. Rachel, Rachel. Hello. Oh, it works. There we go. So hello, my name is John. Hi, my name is Hian, and like Rachel said, you're. You're probably here to see John. And, and that's OK. John is definitely more Twitter famous than me. I think it's like 80,000 followers. I have like 15. I'm, 14 I'm of them are like bots, them. though. I'm one. Okay. He's one. Right? He's one of my followers. <laughs> and the last one is, besides John, is my mom. But I think she wanted to get on Facebook, but ended on Twitter. But anyways, um, I promise you a good time, because after all, we're in Vegas. Um, and John and I, and I are pretty excited to uh, provide an early sneak peek into a performance and improvement framework for data form product. So quickly, an overview of the talk. We're going to cover some background to our effort, overview of the capabilities, and some counterintuitive observation that we observed through our research, and next steps, and of course, a little bit of, hopefully, a bit of wisdom. So first, some background. And for this, we have to go back into Amplitude history. Um, early on, our customers were just savvy growth teams that, frankly, were just building mobile apps. They were the classic early adopter. Um, a decade has happened. Uh, and we're in this massive shift in how companies are operating and changing. Product, product thinking, John Cutler, <laughs> product or operating models are the front and center of everything we do. Um, progress varies by size, industry, segments. And at Amplitude, we're pretty lucky. We've talked to a lot of customers. Some of you are here today. Um, and they keep asking us questions like, how do we get better at building digital products? How do we stack up? You get the idea. Um, and so that's what John and I wanted to tackle. How can we give actionable and contextual guidance to our customers to help them to be more successful? Not which is our product, but Overall. Great. Next. So what we developed is a capability model. So you're probably thinking, maturity model? No, a capability model is not a maturity model. So what a capability model is, is that you start with some element of performance. So in this case, rate of innovation, uh, sustainable revenue growth, increased customer lifetime value. And you create a hypothesis that a group of capabilities have some relationship with that particular outcome. Uh, how did we go about doing this? So, you know, in our normal workshops, we speak to lots of teams. We also interviewed lots of teams. We looked at the existing literature. And then we asked some experts uh, who have a high end a lot across lots of teams to kind of reality check what we're doing. So we went really, really deep. This is sort of one of hundreds of these boards. So Faroon is still here from Miro. I am his number one fan. Um, this is how I think, too, which is annoying to some people. Okay. So the thing is that product, this was our biggest problem. Product is vast. It's an overlap of you know, dozens of disciplines. 
you could say product management. Well, not just product management. There's also analytics, there's design, there's engineering, there's marketing, there's business modeling, there's consumer psychology. It's so big. In fact, whole capability models exist for just one of these things. So that, that was our problem. <laughs> so we had to strike a balance between detail and then having a model that was usable for you folks. Because all models are wrong, obviously. Hopefully this one's useful. Hopefully. <laughs> Great. So what we did was we divided the model into two parts. And there is a loop with some capabilities, kind of unique to the product loop. But remember, we had to make it general enough. We have customers here who are marketers. We have customers here who are in customer success. So when we say product, we mean product at the highest level here. You could think of this as a problem-solving loop. Now, the loop has capabilities on it. And the highest performing team, teams do, in fact, move through this loop more gracefully, nimbly, faster, more effectively. This is legitimately true. But the important thing is it's not just one loop. You'll notice that it's a bunch of integrated loops. So integrated learning informs your strategy. Integrated learning helps you measure things better. So it's not just a simple loop. You could say it's a flywheel, because everyone likes flywheels. OK. The important thing is that things are fractal. And this is one of the earliest things we discovered. People say, well, do an assessment for our company. Your company is not just one company. <laughs> your company is dozens of cultures and dozens of things. So you could imagine that a team works through this loop, and they have their particular strategy. And then at the highest level, a company uh, will have a strategy, and they're all related. So that's like one little complexity here. And second, so we've got the loop. Second, we have a set of supporting capabilities ranging from things like culture and operating model to technology, et cetera. Now, you could think there's a loop and there's supporting capabilities. Why did they do that? Well, the supporting capabilities are required to get the loop going, keep it spinning, uh, speed it up, <laughs> and then when your strategy changes, you have to recalibrate and in a sense, spin up this loop from the ground up again. A lot of you are in large companies that might be disrupted in some ways or another, and you had a strategy before. You're kind of starting fresh. You need to get that strategy going uh, from the beginning. So what we're going to do now is walk through some of the capabilities in the loop. Boom. So like anything we do in product, uh, we need a strategy, a product strategy, an opinionated view on how to win. Now, there are like so many definitions <laughs> of strategy out there as they're like business book authors. But one description that John and I really like is from a book called Good Strategy, Bad Strategy by Richard Rommel. And Richard states that um, a strategy is not a goal or objectives. A strategy is actually a battle plan for action that is designed upon a unique set of attributes or condition. Richard calls it kernel that set a company apart from its competitor and result in exceptional growth. Now, to bring this first capability to life uh, and all the capabilities, we have an example, an imaginary fintech company whose product strategy is to help people align their banking activities, such as savings, investing, or you know, spending, with their ethics and belief. The kernel is that the ethics angle will get more loyal banking customers, um, inspire a mission-driven team, and then, of course, help them acquire customers more cheaply. So you have your strategy, you have your battle plan, but you need a mental model to describe how it all works, to describe value creation. When, when John and I refer to the word model here, we're really talking about quality models, so like flywheel, North Star framework, impact trees, and developing and communicating this mo the, uh, these model is a unique skill set. So back to our example, uh, the FinTech company uh, uses the North Star framework. Um, and their North Star is primary bankers, individuals who have decided to make their company their primary bank. And growing this North Star is a function of ease of uh, funding accounts, providing banking insights, and integrating banking across their financial lives. Uh, so you have your strategy, you have your model that, that describes value creation. Now you need to add minimal viable measurements to the model. So the, the question here is, can a company take a qualitative model and measure it quantitatively? So back to our example, who's uh, the fintech company who Northstar is primary bankers, their metrics is the number of unique users with direct deposit and spending in the last 30 days. Back to John for the rest of the loop. Awesome. 
So you have an opinionated strategy, you're able to get it out of your head into a series of qualitative models and then add measurement to the model. The highest performing teams do these things a lot better <laughs> than the teams that are not quite as effective. At that point though, you haven't really built anything yet. Well, not yet. <laughs> so the next step is you need to de detect what we call leverage points. And so those are places where if you apply a little bit of energy, you can create outsized results. It's where you focus your experiments. It could be called prioritization, but it's not prioritizing what to build. It's prioritizing the leverage point that if you focus your energy there, you're gonna get outsized results. And these highest performing teams make just progress, uh, better decisions when it comes about where to focus. So example in our FinTech example, maybe funding the account is a point of leverage. Anything and any experiments they try there are gonna have potentially an outsized result. Okay. Let's see, what do? Okay, but we haven't built anything yet. <laughs> <laughs> so at this point, you need to place the right bets. And I actually don't care what you call them. You could call them projects or features or wing dangs or anything like that. But at some point, you're gonna do something to influence those leverage points. You're gonna design and build experiments to do that. Now these highest performing teams just make progressively better, incrementally better decisions on how to design these bets, how to run better experiments. And so for example, in this case, maybe they add one funding source. Their question is, does it help or hurt conversions? Um, now we're kind of not in the weeds, but we're into the building and designing and the experimenting side. Next, you need to understand the impact of those bets. So this is one of the keys, not just on the immediate conversion, but on sustainable and long-term and differentiated growth. So these teams that do better at this, not only are experimenting for something they can act on right now, but they understand the impact of that thing on what matters in the long term. So for example, maybe in this case, they improve funding efficacy, but did it actually increase the likelihood to become a primary banker? That's the real question that you're getting at. Then finally is one of the most important things and something you need to look at at your company. Are you integrating learning back into your strategy, into your models, into where you focus, into how you measure, into the experiments that you run? And even the most data-driven companies in the world, when I talk to them, it's like, well, we're maybe experiments all the time. I was like, well, is it, <laughs> does anyone know about them? They're like, no, 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 no one really knows about them. So in this case, the example, you know, maybe we find out that we in fact did improve conversions in the bank, but not long-term retention. Ah, okay, but did we integrate that learning back to the rest of the company? So where do teams encounter trouble when they're moving through this loop and how can you use just this loop part before we get into the other capabilities? Well, there's many reasons why things could go wrong, but you could just start out asking where are you are getting friction. So some teams can't ship anything. They just, just don't make great design decisions or they ship things that are unusable. And some teams struggle when it comes to integrating learning. They actually ship things and they actually understand the impact, but they don't spread that through their organization. And some teams don't have an actual product strategy, an opinionated strategy. Moving up into the enterprise is not a strategy. Okay, it's super, it's, not, it's general. Now some teams have a reasonable strategy, but they can't operationalize it. So it's up there, the slide, the three bullets, everyone's like, nod, 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 V2 mom, you're all set. But then when it comes to actually putting those pieces into motion, to creating the models and aligning people, deploying the strategy, they have trouble. Some teams are what I would call functional feature factories. The designers are working, it's fairly usable, they ship things, it kind of works, but they never know if anything that they built actually had any impact. And then some teams actually have a reasonable strategy, can ship bets, can learn, do all those things, they just make consistently not great decisions when it comes where to prioritize, where they're focusing. So you can see just at the highest level, you can start to think about where is your team working? So theory of constraint says that your system is constrained by a small number of things at any given time that move around. So you don't need to improve everything. You just need to actually improve the area <laughs> that you're experiencing trouble in. So that's the loop, but the loop does not magically spin up. Yes, the loop does not magically spin up. <laughs> Spinning up the loop requires supporting capabilities. So for the next part of the talk, We'll describe these supporting capabilities, uh, but importantly, how they accelerate and drag on the loop. We'll dwell deeper in some areas and others in the interest of time. So with that, we'll start with culture and operating model. So the first part is- This is really important. Yes, how <laughs> initiatives get funded. Uh, basic here is you wanna move from a project-centric funding model to a product-centric funding model. A funding model that encourages innovation 
and experimentation, but still aligned to the overall strategy. So progress looks like companies that have fluid allocation of funding to product initiatives with momentum. They double down on things that work, they nix things that doesn't. Drag, well, you have companies that have big batch project funding with zero room for experimentation or growth. So funding is critical, but so is how your team is aligned, right? So what we need is value chain aligned teams, ideally aligned to your company's strategy. Now, we know that a lot of companies ship their org, <laughs> Amplitude and sometimes too, but if that's the case, then the org needs to reflect what your customer value. And this applies to non-customer facing team like platform teams and data teams. How can they trace the value of their work to what the customer cares? So progress signal is very, here is very simple. Teams can easily trace the value work to external customers. Companies who, are, who, are, who does this really well generally provide better customer experience. Drag signal, on the hand, is there's lots of dependencies. You conduct zero experimentation, and generally companies that don't do this well have a degraded customer experience. So we have funding, how you, how you fund your initiatives, how teams should align, but we haven't talked about how teams should operate, right? Teams should have actual inputs in the near term while still focusing on the long-term view. Now, we observe many companies think big, they aren't able to ship or learn quickly. Other companies are, air quote, agile, but they know not how to work small. Effectively, they don't have a product strategy. The highest performing team think big and work small. So progress signal is that teams have a clear, quantifiable, near-term focus, but they're confident that they're contributing to the long-term success. Drag signal is lots of reactivity on teams. They're constantly chasing silver bullets and they're continually pivoting. So we cover how teams should operate funding, but we haven't covered what kind of leaders are needed for a data-informed product way of working. Data-informed product working requires leaders with modern digital chops. The work experience matters. You need digital leaders that have firsthand and recent experience at doing this because, frankly, the state of the art is constantly evolving. Now, this doesn't mean that Leadership experience, uh, this is the negate leadership, general leadership experience, it's a balance of both. So progress signal is companies that have leaders who provide rooms for their team to experiment. They have actually a digital strategy, not just a business strategy. And drag signal is you have companies with lots of big bang strategy shifts, less leeway, and, and a lot of reactivity. Cool. So we'll run through some of the next ones. This is kind of well-worn research, but just it might be a summary. So there's three skills or capabilities around psychological safety, experimentation mindset, and what uh, is called double loop learning. And I'll just run through those. So Amy Edmondson you know, coined the idea of team psychological safety, and it's a shared belief held by team members that things are safe for interpersonal risk taking. It's safe to experiment, it's safe to take risks, it's safe to question the status quo. And this very much holds up when you look across particular teams. So a, a positive signal there is you will see opportunities for people to raise their hand and pull the end on cord and say, I don't think this is working out the way we think. And drag signals here is nine months later, you look back on something that went wrong and you just see numerous opportunities mm -hmm. that people were even saying it among themselves, but no one felt safe enough to raise their hand and say, we're going on the wrong track here. Now, psychological safety alone doesn't create an experimentation mindset. Frankly, I think the word experiment gets thrown around a lot, and it's just placeholder for just try it and don't ask too many questions. Let's just run an experiment. Um, but real experimentation takes discipline, and I'm talking about the discipline of pulling features, of reviewing what the experiment taught you, of regular learning reviews. And it doesn't mean every experiment needs to be a controlled uh, experiment. It just means that there's a level of discipline involved and rigor with what you're doing. And so, for example, progress signals here are failed experiments. <laughs> I always ask the company, well, how's it going? They're like, well, the experiments are going great. Has anything failed? They're like, no, no. Which probably means they're not really running experiments because they're not learning anything. So it's, um, yeah, there's a search algorithm that explains that really well. Okay, the next thing is the drag signal is that you experiment in name only, that kind of, we're gonna run some experiments, but there's no real review and no follow-up. And let me get this to go straight. 
And then finally, we have double loop learning, which is what I consider to be kind of one of the fundamental things here. And it's the ability, especially for the companies of yours that are in a sort of disrupted transition. And that's the ability to re-examine the core beliefs and mental models. So these models that underpin everything. So what we find at Amplitude is some teams are experimenting all the time, but when it comes to questioning the core beliefs under their strategy, there's not suitable safety, there's not an environment where they can question. There's very data-driven, but when it comes time to pivot, they're just not able to question those beliefs. So the progress signal there, you see people sort of revisit and redefine these underlying models. The drag signal is just stubborn attachment to beliefs. Year after year after year, just stubborn attachment to the core underpinning beliefs. Awesome. So we cover operating model practices and culture. We really haven't covered modern development deployment practices that enable teams to be more outcome focused and frankly create an environment with less dependencies, right? So when we refer to practice, we're talking about like feature flagging, continuous integration, loosely coupled architecture, all this is foundational, and they're just part of the plumbing. We drew heavily from the DevOps research and assessment report, and progress signal looks like, well, companies are continuously delivering on product and features. They remedy issues pretty quickly. They have safe releases in days and not in weeks or months. And drag signal is, well, frequent outages, long lead time, and if, and if your team is going to sleep and they're afraid of that things are breaking, well, no amount of empowerment is going to change things. You just have to fix the problem. You need to empower them to fix the problem. Exactly, <laughs> fix the problem. <laughs> so, the, at the end of the day, the loop is just about being customer-centric, right? So, the smooth function of the loop is a function of integrated customer knowledge. And this spans ability things like to identify the customer, a view of the customer journey, the right balance between qualitative and quantitative data, and segmentation. So progress signal here is, well, teams have strong collaboration, maybe between marketing and product. They're more explicit <coughs> with their targeting when it comes to experimentation. Drag signal, well, you have siloed customer knowledge. You have companies with things like all things to all people strategy. We're gonna build for everybody. Um, oh. So understanding customer knowledge is important, but so is the mechanism to which you distribute that knowledge to the rest of your company for decision making. After all, moving through the loop is all about decisioning, data-informed product decisioning, which includes things like data access, awareness of your taxonomy, data storytelling, and really the right balance between self-sufficiency and insight quality. So progress signal here is teams are fairly competent at data-informed decision-making. They have a great data onboarding based on your role and your expertise, and drag signal here is huge gaps between center of expertise and average employees. So, so far, you're probably wondering <laughs> that why is this model about amplitude? We are amplitude employees. Um, that's on purpose. While we think we're great, we're part of a bigger ecosystem that support data-informed product way of working. And some might call the modern data stack, John and I are calling this capability the modern data stack too, because frankly, we kind of ran out of <laughs> naming ideas. But with that said, our definition of it is aligned to experimentation, data access, quick reaction times, and you're empowering teams closest to the problem to solve, this, solve the problem autonomously, but still aligned to the strategy. And frankly, the, the stack supports all the other capabilities to save experimentation, data literacy, and even modern development practices. So, Progress signal is, well, the, the, the loop is printing pretty fast. Access to insights and experimentation are reasonably fast and self-serve. And drag signal, well, one team processing all insights and experimentation, too much dependency for innovation of speed. Awesome. So that uh, quick summary, so we have the seven capabilities, there's these interlocking loops, we could call it a flywheel. We've got these set of maybe a dozen or so supporting capabilities. We have a lot more to do. Um, but one thing is if you're like, oh, that's just common sense, that's actually good. Because <laughs> if you're saying that this is uncommon sense, uh, that would be a problem. Now, one important thing here, if there's one thing to take away here, is that often people come, especially to me, or other people say, well, just how do we fix that? And kind of like a doctor, I need to look at, there are some problems in product that have a 
root cause, and you can just say, take this bit of medicine, and everything's gonna be fine. But so many things in product are complex and interlinked. Example, uh, you don't have the right funding structure, so your product leader gets sick and of it and leaves, and then you don't have the leadership, and then the data leader leaves, and then the modern data stack breaks, and then you're just going round and around the loop. So a lot of it is more like addressing sort of chronic or complex challenges, you just can't pin down a root cause. Now you can in some cases, but not in others. But in talking to product leaders, the big thing we get is, okay, you know, John and he and we get this, we've mm -hmm. done, gone through this already. Okay, but can you just tell us what to invest in right now? <laughs> I get it, it's all common sense, yay for common sense. Um, but where do we focus? And we really think that this is almost like for many companies is a million, this is not a trivial decision. Because you know what, here's, here's the talk I had to the CPO. The CPO's like, John, everyone's giving me books. I mean, I've got Accelerate, I'm supposed to empower the teams, then I'm supposed to blitz scale this, and then I'm supposed to create a fearless organization. Like, I get it all, it's all great. Um, and, and I've become, to, actually, I used to be that person who's antagonizing those leaders, but now I've become a lot more empathetic. Like, this is a really hard decision. <laughs> you know, do you sort of, hire everyone with the chops, or do you try to build it from the ground up, or you build safety? It's not a trivial decision at all. So what we wanted to end with is some, what we would call like the uncommon sense, the counterintuitive things that we see many, many organizations get wrong. And then we're gonna give you a link to this assessment that, that we're gonna beta test and we'll send you the assessment over time so you can you know, explore the rest of the model. So number one thing, companies are wasting an incredible amount of money on context-free improvement. Well, I heard we have to do OKRs, so everyone's gonna do OKRs. I heard we have to have small teams, so we're gonna have 600 small teams. Um, in, and a great example here are these disrupted large enterprises that are just trying to monoprocess across thousands of people, or frankly, like a startup that's like, I guess we need to grow up now, so we need a grown-up leader, and the leader's not the right thing for the context. You know? So that problem pervades, so either copy and pasting things which should actually be customized, or spending forever customizing things that could actually be copy and pasted that are fairly stable. So that's the number one thing. We're gonna go into more details in future talks, but if there's one thing to consider is what does your context represent? And in general, if there's more disruption and things are more dynamic and things are more complex, you're gonna need to experiment more, you're gonna be more, have to be more open that a lot of things you don't expect to happen will happen. The next thing is not to harp on the dependencies thing, but every time you say, well, what's the problem? People will say dependencies, but they still underestimate the impact of dependencies. And my joke with Marty Kagan is like, Marty Kagan, that's great, but if all the teams are dependent, it doesn't matter how much you empower them, right? <laughs> like, you need to empower them to reduce the number of dependencies uh, to do these things. Routinely underestimated. And not just the hard dependencies, but also the soft dependencies, like waiting for the CEO to bless something, or needing context, or needing data, or uh, dependent on other teams for emotional support. You know, there's so many dependencies across, dependencies are not inherently bad, um, but teams routinely underestimate just how much impact they have. So here, you know, what you need to consider is what are the hard and soft dependencies and what's really dragging down. These modern product practices we talk about almost require a level of aligned autonomy. They will not work. If you have to plan your roadmap a year in advance, there is no way you're gonna experiment. It's just the end of the story, right? And so you have to figure out, so that's your dependency at that moment. You're dependent on your annual budget, budgeting process. That's your core thing. And the last counterintuitive observation is that question. there's a huge difference between the dominant traditional model for analytics versus data form way of working, right? Uh, and, and a lot of you probably encountered this, right? Which is you have a question, you send your analysts, they give you a dashboard, a KPI, you have a question again, you go back. But product-like working is pretty different. Um, it's pre predominantly a problem-solving pro situation with a lot of creativity. It's not a delivery process. So, if you have a data leader who um, hasn't really worked with a product team, they truly don't appreciate that. So data-informed product requires a shift in mindset, tooling, and structure, and technology. So consider, what does your savvy analyst need to do to learn um, about product to become more product-oriented, and what is and your- And vice versa. <laughs> and vice versa, right? What is your product 
leader needs to learn about data to become more data informed. So we definitely have more insights to share, and in the interest of time, we focus on key areas within the loop. Um, we will share the model, uh, both the main loop and its work capability, the description, and what accelerates them. Um, we did some counterintuitive observation, and as, as John and I stated earlier, we really want to provide contextual guidance to help you all improve. So yes, like I said, we have still a lot of work to do. Here's a quick roadmap of our efforts. Um, our next goal is to deliver beta of a self-surface We just almost knocked off share model publicly, he and. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Uh, and, then, and then hopefully <laughs> a, a, a public self-serve assessment and improvement plan to, uh, for y'all to access. So we want to offer everyone here who, um, a, an early access to our minimum viable assessment. Uh, we'll be setting this out shortly in the coming weeks. Uh, so please sign up with the QR code up there. Um, and thank you, uh, John and I are grateful for you to be here. And Rachel's gonna come back and lead you. Thank you, you all so one. much. Thank you so much.